Warning, this episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intentions of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to control, spiders, puppets, and predestination. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives Wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Welcome back everyone to my gradual descent into madness at the hands of fictional fear gods. As you no doubt have guessed from all the content I made about it, I love the Magnus Archives, and I think one of the biggest reasons it works for me as a horror fan is because TMA has an amazing organization of fear into 15 different categories. Of course, because I hate myself, I looked at that and went, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I explained all of them in the form of video essays? Well, here we are. Part 2 of my attempt to explain every entity from the Magnus Archives, and today we're setting up a web. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. Keir, and this is Afton Talks, where today I'm going to explain the web from the Magnus Archives. Before we do though, I've got a couple of things to mention. First off, if you want to watch the episodes of this series in a simple way, there should now be a card to a playlist, where I'll be posting each episode as they come out. If you missed the one on the eye, you can find it there. Also, since I'm a small YouTuber and it's been drilled into my mind, if you click that subscribe button down below, you'll become part of an exclusive club that only 1.3% of my viewers have joined. That number is actually higher than last time, which makes sense because subscribing is totally free, only takes a second, and means you're more likely to catch the rest of this series when it comes out. Alright, shilling over, let's continue this web series. The web also known as the spider, the great spider, the spinner of schemes, the mother of puppets, the mother, or the hidden machination is, as almost all of the names allude to, deeply connected to arachnophobia. However, the spider also finds itself as the fear of being controlled, manipulated, being trapped in circumstances you can't escape from, and not being aware of your actions and the fact that they're not your own. These fears tend to manifest with strings, webs, dangling hooks, web patterns, marionettes, addiction, and obviously spiders. The web is also the only of the entities blessed with self-awareness, which allows it to develop and carry out the many plots which make up its vast and tangled web. The Mother of Puppets has a good variety of human servants who can help carry out its intricate plans, which makes its job a lot easier and mine a fair deal harder. First up is Annabelle Kane, a young woman who, after a traumatic experience in her youth involving quite a large spider, partook in an arachnophobia study that accidentally turned her into an avatar of the web. Not the intended effect, but quite an impactful one indeed. Annabelle seems to have gained some level of control over others, along with a degree of communication with her patron of fear, and all it cost her was a chunk of her head. After the study, Annabelle would go on to stalk and slightly manipulate the Magnus Institute and its employees towards the mass ritual. Once the change occurred, Annabelle spent a little while hanging out with Celesa before killing him and stealing his camera, all in an effort to expose both the vast chasm in reality below Hilltop Road and the web's plan to escape from a dying world. While her plan seems to go into effect, we have no idea whether Annabelle is dead or alive as of the end of the series. Neil Ligorio is next up on the web's list of wonderful weavers, and boy was he busy. Ligorio worked with practical effects and film puppeteering, quickly becoming one of the best in his field, all while serving the web. He also might have worked with Gabriel, an agent of the spiral, but that's a little uncertain. What we do know for sure is that Ligorio began suffering from a degenerative muscular disease in the early 2000s, and had to be cared for by longtime friend Allison Kalala as his motor skills gradually degraded. By the end, Ligorio had built himself a massive pulley system to be able to still move around his house as normal, even with his body unable to move. Eventually, Ligorio would be found dead after a five month long visit from Annabelle Kane, but even during that time, he could not be stopped, as Ligorio took the opportunity to make a giant spider puppet for Widow's Weave. Speaking of Widow's Weave, there's also the director of the film, Dexter Banks, who, while not expressly stated to be connected to the web, is at least enamored with one of its lighteners. 
though again it's unclear how much of the web's magic here is Ligorio or Leitner. If you remember back to the last episode of the series where we covered the eye, you'll no doubt recall Emma Harvey, who was one of Gertrude's assistants. Harvey spent her time as an archival assistant trying her very hardest to get her co-workers killed in the form of twisted experimentation. While she would succeed in getting rid of many of them, her reign of terror would come to an end when she was burned alive by Agnes Montague as proposed by Gertrude Robinson herself. There's also that one lady that Trevor Herbert encountered who was full of spiders, but we know so little that a sentence is about all I can give. Finally, this brings us to the section of the show I like to call, Let's Name All the Residents of Hilltop Road. It's a misnomer, though, since most of them don't actually have names. To start, we have Raymond Fielding, who was a bit of a recluse and ran a halfway house for troubled children where they prayed to a creepy web table and eventually became spider food. He was also in charge of Agnes Montague, which, as you might expect, did not end well for him. There's also Joffrey Nickham, who was very paranoid. The sculptor of puppets, who used tendons for marionette strings, and the writer of anonymous letters, who knew way too much about others, which maybe meant he was an avatar of the eye. Sorry for missing that last video. And probably used that power to make the world's worst pieces of chainmail. With all the people out of the way, we now get to talk about the artifacts caught in the web. Probably the most important items associated with the web are, of course, the many tape recorders which appear throughout TMA, because as Annabelle herself says, Fine material to spin a web with, don't you think? Well, you could argue that the tapes don't really count as artifacts, I would say that their importance to the story means that I should at least mention them here. Another object strongly connected to both the web and our protagonist Jonathan Sims is the web lighter, which manages to appear at almost every notable plot point. While the tapes serve to keep an eye, pun intended, on John, the lighter serves to influence John's decision by acting as a symbol of smoking, a common addiction which is right on brand for the web. The lighter is also confirmed to be what allows the web to follow John around which makes it the perfect device for its machinations. Oh, and it sort of brings about the end of the change and allows the entities to escape into the universe. That's probably important. The next most important item belonging to the web is of course the web table, because between that and the web lighter, it seems that the mother of puppets isn't the most creative artifact namer. This intricately carved table has an entrapping hypnotic pattern on it including a small wooden box in the middle, while its original use is only briefly seen during its ownership by Raymond Fielding, where he utilizes it for murder. Its most notable use in the series is as a prison for the not-them, which Adelard Decker binds to the table after it takes Carl. Fortunately for not Carl, it's a pretty table, so it found its way to more people with a little help from everyone's favorite delivery duo, Brecon and Hope. Specifically, we see the Not Them take Graham Folger while he was holding on to it, then take Sasha James during Prentice's attack on the Magnus Institute. Now, getting back to the table, after John discovers the secret of Not Sasha, he tries to kill it by destroying the table it was bound to. Unfortunately, John gets slapped in the face for being genre savvy when the Not Them, rather than being destroyed, is released from the control of the table whatever that actually meant within the context. While the not-them does a lot more stuff, this isn't an episode about the stranger, so we'll come back to it later. While we're on the topic of traumatizing John, let's talk about the Lightner that kicked off the entire plot, A Guest for Mr. Spider. This traumatic children's book encaptures the reader, much like the table, then leads them away to a door from which the eponymous Mr. Spider spirits them away. This almost happened to hapless Jonathan Sims as a child, but fortunately, a bully of his met that fate instead of him. There's also Kumo Go Tabete Iru, which I definitely said wrong. Technically, that's the name of the Japanese 60s film inspired by the book, but it's the closest we have. This story, which literally translates to The Spiders Are Eating, would later become the inspiration for Dexter Banks' final film, Widow's Weave. The film lands squarely within the resume of Neil Ligorio, whose entire body of work in their original cuts also could be considered artifacts of the web, 
While it's unclear what exactly they do to people, it seems that they once again exhibit the entrapping effect of other web artifacts as seen in the five months lost to Kilala. There's also a weird silk-covered object that Breakin and Hope deliver around, and also the Chalicerai website, developed by Gregory Cox, where people could order hits in exchange for stories to satisfy the story spinner, which is both surprisingly I like in nature and also my high school nickname. Unlike the vast amounts of artifacts attributed to the web, there are fortunately few locations belonging to the web. In fact, pre-change, Basically, the only place affiliated with the web is, of course, 105 Hilltop Road, a strange house with a strange tree housing strange people and getting burned down in several strange fires. All of this strangeness is probably because of the giant rift in the universe residing beneath it. But we'll get back to that when we talk about the domains. This'll be another really quick one, because the web hasn't actually performed a ritual. Now, Smirk probably did create a ritual for it, but as far as we know, no such ritual was ever attempted. While it's originally presumed that this may be as a result of the web enjoying the world as it is, with all of the tiny manipulations it can enact, it is also very possible that the web was simply waiting for the mass ritual and planning its escape from the dying reality of the Magnus Archives. With that in mind, actually, I'll go ahead and explain the web's plan to the best of my ability. So, as far as I can tell, at some point during the development of the fears, the web gained a level of sentience, and with it the knowledge of its limitations. In an attempt to expand its reach, the web began putting into motion events that would bring about the end of the world, and in the process, allow the fears to escape into a multitude of other realities. It selected the eye as its focus, believing the eye to be the most foolish of the entities, and during the tenure of Jonathan Sims as head archivist of the Magnus Institute, these events came to pass. This entire plan was hinged on the greatest stronghold of the web, 105 Hilltop Road, below which sits a rift in reality that the web and other fears could use to escape. With the pupil of the eye and the archives destroyed at the same time, it is implied by the ending of Mag 200 that whatever escape the web had planned proved effective though the presence of an upcoming, as of the time of writing at least, sequel series, with heavy web imagery in its promotion, may be evidence to the contrary. Of course, before all that though, there are also the domains ruled over by the web in the post-change world. The most obvious of these is the theater, an expansive domain filled with, as the name suggests, theaters. Feeding on the fear of losing control to addiction, this domain turns the metaphorical hooks of addiction into literal ones, which dangle from the legs of giant spiders and hook into the flesh of those trapped in their endless performance. As they get puppeteered around the stage, the people trapped in the theater are forced to intake tiny spiders through all forms of addiction-themed means, including bottles and injections, all the while being aggravated by the voices of those who led to their addictions. These plays repeat over and over in a physical representation of the cycle of addiction. The Necropolis, last mentioned in the Eye video, again, just go watch that, the suggested order is very useful, also has elements of the web in it, given how it forces people to mourn individuals they despise. Given Annabelle's residence in Upton House with Celesa during the change, I imagine that there's a fair amount of web influence there, even if it doesn't officially count as a domain. Hilltop Road also makes an appearance here, obviously, and as mentioned at least three times before, it's where Annabelle uses the camera taken from Salesa to reveal the crack in reality below it. I already talked about this, no need to go over it again. Alright, time to talk about connections. In our last episode, we talked about the eye, so that's probably a pretty good place to start. The eye seems to have been, to some degree at least, manipulated by the web in the name of allowing the entities to escape. Obviously, the web has many ties to Jonathan Sims, head archivist of the Magnus Institute, given his early encounter with it and the persistent web imagery that follows him around. The web does seem to help him on many occasions, such as allowing him to discover Prentice's attack or bringing him the tapes of Sasha, but all of that was just for a greater purpose, as it has just as many situations where it intentionally puts him in peril in the name of getting a mark on him, such as orchestrating the encounter with Jared Hopworth. Going from maybe positive to pretty neutral, we see the corruption interacting with the web. 
While most of the things that creep and crawl belong to the corruption, spiders are an interesting exception, but they do seem to connect a lot. The web is implied to have been in some way responsible for Prentice's interactions with the Flesh Hive, but also reveals her plot early, which leaves it uncertain how they actually feel about each other. However, one entity we don't have to wonder about is the Desolation. The Desolation and the Web have an intensely antagonistic relationship, which is shown time and again in the series, and seems to build on the difference between the Web's intricate plans and the Desolation's unfocused chaos. Gertrude binds herself to Agnes Montague with help from the Web, while Agnes left a mark on 105 Hilltop Road in her youth. Hell, John even says that the Web doesn't like fire when commenting on Daisy's magnesium flares. However, the web was also helped indirectly by the Desolation, in the use of fire both to expand the rift and destroy the archives. Also, as someone who's burned cobwebs before, let me tell you, it's pretty damn effective. Alright, time for some analysis. Now, it should probably come as no surprise that I really like the web. I love spiders, hell, I use a lot of spider imagery around here, and I've always found marionettes very interesting. Pair that with really interesting questions of free will and analyses of addiction, and you've got yourself a very unique idea set. Ironically, the web is what managed to get TMA caught in my mind, because after listening to Piecemeal and Lost John's Cave back to back, I thought it couldn't get better, and then I got to listen to a man talking about how he thought he was going crazy since he kept seeing a spider, and then wound up dead. That was the moment for me that TMA went from, oh, this is a cool podcast, to I'm finishing this and the end of the world couldn't stop me. And I think it's probably pretty responsible for getting me to this video, through some convoluted string of events. The mother of puppets would be proud. Regardless, the web presents a lot of curious possibilities regarding free will, and even whether or not the spider itself has any. It's implied that the web, despite actively helping bring it about, quite dislikes the control of the eye in the post-change world, which paints an interesting picture of its own existence. The web orchestrates the motions of others, but it may itself not actually have any free will. If the web's hidden machinations bring about questions of free will for the characters, it would make sense then that it would be just as susceptible to such manipulations. Last episode, I mentioned how the eye could be read as a stand-in for the audience, and in much the same way, I believe the web could be seen as a stand-in for the author, the ultimate being of control in this world and the only truly sentient creature, the author carefully choreographs the steps of the characters, planning their every move and putting them to script. The characters are functionally puppets for the author to move around and control for the enjoyment of the watching audience and for its own satisfaction. Throughout the series, the presence of the author is felt in careful nudges and cautiously planted hints, much in the same way the web acts on the Institute. Hell, even the escape of the web seems similar to an author's final moments writing a work, knowing that it's nearing its freedom and orchestrating the final moments to allow it to spread to other newer worlds. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could tie the web's theme of addiction to this whole web of metaphor with the writing and creating a unique world itself as a very addictive force which can be hard for an author to let go, even once the world and its stories are complete. I'm not sure Johnny really intended for us to read him as the web, but it is an approach to viewing the narrative he created, and I both believe it is interesting, and also haven't really seen brought up anywhere else before. Well then. That brings us to the end of our discussion of the web. What did you think? Is there anything that I missed? Feel free to share your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. I'll see you all back here on the next episode to deep dive into the one alone. Good night, y'all.